It's now just past my 20th anniversary of working on The Lion King, literally every week of my life for the last 20 plus years. People have a very emotional connection to The Lion King, myself included. And because it's existed as a film, as books, as, as music, it, it ends up in people's homes and then touches them so much because of its theatrical experience. It took animation from being this sort of respected, nice niche world, and it really brought animation to being in the mainstream. It's always about where do these things come from? Why do they happen? It's been such a huge juggernaut. Who knew that it would be so successful? I wonder if we've shrunk Margaret. at all since then. Oh my God, let's sit up straight so we don't look like we're old, old shrunken men. Okay. Okay. It grew from this kind of dusty nature documentary into something that was this wonderful human emotional allegory. It deals with betrayal and with the death of a father and it's got a love story in the middle of it. Um, it's got fart jokes. I mean, what more can you ask for? In some ways, it's kind of an accident. It was just, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, we're putting, the, we're making this stew, and everyone put in a little bit here. We'll take that out, and it just turns out to be a great meal. Yeah, absolutely. It felt like we were part of uh, these movies that just seemed to live for years and years through generations. So that was that was pretty exciting. It has that emotional context, which was even, if possible, enhanced on the stage. One of the reasons why the Lion King worked was that it was a Good collaboration. Hello, darling. It wasn't an American story or an African story. It's a kind of mythological tale set on animals, which means it's almost like a fable that would speak to every single culture. through the hallways of Walt Disney Studios in Burbank, California. Hollow and uh, Yeah, they are hollow. These are actually the hallways that Walt Disney walked. And uh, these guys are the directors of Lion King. And we're gonna go see the uh, animators who we haven't seen in like 17 years. Well, I guess it was 1994 that we were sitting on this very bench. Right. That's right. Yeah, and being interviewed about the same movie. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't anything changed since then? I don't know. Have we moved forward? Yes, we've moved forward. <laughs> yeah. This is like a home improvement show. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hey. Oh. Hi, kids. Look who I brought with me. Hey. <laughs> One of the most difficult things, in a way, was coming on the heels of, of a, a number of very successful movies. Right. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin. Aladdin preceded us. Um, they were, you know, they'd sort of broken uh, records. And we were sort of stuck with that, oh my god, are we going to be able to live up to this high bar that's been set for us? And we were kind of terrified that we really weren't going to. What do you guys remember about the first time you heard about Lion King? Didn't we have a wine and cheese party? I think we Isn't always had a wine and cheese party. Started? Yeah. No, there was a, a Pocahontas <laughs> party and the King of the Jungle party. And after Aladdin, everybody had a choice anyways, and we were invited to these wine and cheese parties. We could look at storyboards and designs, and Pocahontas had all this great my Gabriel drawings, remember? Yeah. About Indians and their beliefs yeah. in magic, and yeah. it looked great to everybody. Pretty much everybody at the studio decided they didn't want to work on Lion King. Everybody <sighs> decided that they'd rather work on Pocahontas, and then we literally had to beg yeah, and go scrape. Around. Would you please animate on our movie? Yeah. You know, Pocahontas seemed like a, just a, a natural next movie, given the uh, four or five films that had actually uh, had come before it people we ended up getting on Lion King were either getting an opportunity for the first time to lead a character or to do something they hadn't done before, or were nuts about drawing animals. Like Andreas Deja, who did Scar, just loved drawing animals. He grew up on Jungle Book and he couldn't get enough of it. I don't know about you guys, I, I didn't look at Jungle Book at all while working on Lion King. Because really? the, t the temptation would have been to yeah. just take too much of what they did and yeah. just use that. and. Yeah. I just went back to real lines as much as I could and Jeremy Irons' face and mixed that up. We were the young guys. We were the guys that 
decided for whatever reason to stay on the B movie, and we thought, you know, we can make something of this. And there was that little chip on our shoulder that we could prove ourselves in some way. I, I think the, the film benefited from that. What we ended up with was this kind of really passionate group of guys and girls who um, thought there was something to this story that you couldn't get out of other movies. The fundamental idea happened with Jeffrey Katzenberg. We were in Europe on a press junket for Oliver and Company. And Jeffrey started talking about his life. The, the story itself came out of a you know, an experience of something that had happened to me, which was about um, growing up, the moment in time that for each of us in our lives in which we go from being a child to being an adult. My father died when I was very young, and, and, and I had one of those crazy moments where I realized I had to actually now deal with it in this movie because how you know the only way you can write music is you have to write it from the heart you, you know it's I, I don't know any other way of doing it I don't think there's any technique really um, and so you know it actually took me to some really dark places I started Disney animation in late 1987 and by the fall of 1990 I was handed this treatment it was sort of a war between lions and baboons. Rafiki was a cheetah. The character of Scar was actually the leader of the baboons. It was a very different tale. The mood of that, of that story was much more serious, much more, you know, blood and nails and, you know, very serious. And uh, when Rob and I sunk our teeth into it, <laughs> we can't be serious all the time. <laughs> a lot of tone decisions were made on a daily basis. It's a very rangy movie, and you can put uh, the death of a parent side by side with a flatulent warthog, you've really got something. And I think that's what is the range of Lion King, is how do you do that? How do you walk that razor's edge the whole time? Here we are sitting in historic Sardis. It's worth pointing out that the three of us have our caricatures up behind us. They're always right behind us whenever we eat at Sardis. I sure. wish they had waited till I took off the makeup. Before they, yeah. yeah. Is it hard to wear French fries actually in your hat? That's the question. No, Are they just there so you can eat. So is that? Yeah, and it makes lunch easier. Yeah. Um, she wrote, "We have come full circle." She had been a waitress at Sardi's, and here she is on the. On <laughs> she the is wall. today. Oh. She's on the wall. Did you two record in the studio together ever? Do you remember? No, I don't think so. No. We did meet in a hallway. I, I recorded after you guys and yeah. met you. We didn't know each other. Yeah, he was very cold. To me. No, that's not true. <laughs> Was I was like, wow, hey, it's Nathan Lane, hi. And he was like, hello. Oh, that I did not. That's how I recall no. it. <laughs> Wouldn't you have thought he would have been more generous? You were the, heroic, the, making this you were the heroic lead of the he's movie. He's always thing. the victim. But I do remember meeting in the hallway. We were both were probably pretty shy yeah. about it. You both are in this gigantic movie. You're, you play all these scenes together, and you didn't even know each other then, and then went no. on to the later meet and yeah. enormous success. So I could hear his tracks. What it is is they recorded him and then I made it work. <laughs> um, you saved essentially his weaker readings by making. Uh, it yeah, I just I, I raised it up. I guess. Is what I mean. The most exciting thing about making these movies is the the energy in the room of these people, of creative people having fun and listening to each other and and adding to that mixture. So to Robin Rogers' credit, and why the movie is as good as it is, is. They are great collaborators. They had a strong vision for what they wanted, but they were also able to go to the animators and say, okay, what do you want to do? What are your aspirations? How do you want to do this? Some of the early designs I did on Simba actually looked more like Matthew Broderick. Uh, it was based a lot on the story sketches. You know, he had the big soulful eyes, the dark hair. The animator who did your character, Ruben Aquino, who was a long-time Disney him. animator. And so he does all those drawings listening to your voice. Yeah, and he sat at the recording Yeah, sometimes. and would sketch you, right? Yeah. And then there was a long conversation that your mane should look like the hair of John Bon Jovi. That yeah, was... I had a beautiful mane. <laughs> I really liked my mane. You looked good with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the breakthrough on his design didn't come till Tony did some uh, Mufasa drawings and then he tried to do Simba with Mufasa's hair. 
that was the breakthrough. And from that, I got the final model sheet on Simba, although there's still some of that, definitely some of that Matthew Broderick in there. I think one of the things that the artists were desperate for was to push the technology. The technology had not been reinvented for 50 years. And the artists wanted to go back to storytelling techniques to help them tell their stories. Move the camera, colored lines, multiplane. One of the lessons I learned personally is there's really no problem you can't solve. Like how do you get able to be stampede animated on the screen? And you know, to actually find somebody that can sit down and, and animate that and turn that into a piece of film is extraordinary. It was absolutely stunning. I thought it was one of the greatest sequences you know, that, that, that I'd seen. And, then I knew that this, this was really about something, you know, about things in animation that maybe hadn't been tackled in that way. Just looking at the stampede would be the one image that would entice me to want to do it in the theater because it's a big challenge. The idea of having to put a wildebeest stampede on the stage, yes, I'd love to try that. It's interesting to these movies, unlike a regular movie, that, that, that you <clears throat> keep changing as you go. I yeah, mean, uh, it's like being out of town with a musical. Yeah. I mean, you can keep making changes. Yeah. And, I mean, and, I did record with somebody who played Nala. And yeah, I, Moira she, Kelly. Nope. I went to the premiere and I was like, hi, Moira Kelly, well, how, what are you doing? She's like, I'm, I play Nala. I was like, oh, really? Because I, I did it with a, a different lady. And somehow nobody ever told me that that had changed. Yeah, these oh. things happen. It's a cruel business, the oh, animation no. business. It's Vicious. not pretty. Well, the, you know, there is a lot One of... One minute you're in a movie, the next, minute, you know, year. you're gone. Yeah. You're not, no longer yeah. Nala. And also it can replace people for singing, you know? You yes. Can change, oh, singing I voices. Yeah, because well, yeah, it wasn't... You'd never... Had you sung before, publicly, before that? No. And I did try. I tried a yeah, few know, times, yeah. and then they said no. Those tracks they, exist still, if you well, like copies of them. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> they were real sweet about it. You know, J Jeremy Irons didn't sing his whole song either. Oh. The great thing about how we found our Timon and Pumbaa was uh, Nathan Lane and Ernie Sabella, who ended up playing the roles, had actually uh, gone in to audition in New York. And they were auditioning for the hyenas. There were two lines from originally recorded as hyenas, which just epitomized Timon and Pumbaa when we played it back. It was uh, Nathan saying, you want one wildebeest now or years of feasting in the future? <laughs> And Ernie said, one meal now, one meal now. <laughs> and immediately it was like, that's Timon and Pumbaa. You recorded a lot with Ernie, and there's tons of stuff in the movie that is improvisational from you. Ernie, uh, scamp that he is, would kind of make fart noises, you know, with his hand, you know, you know, you know and, um, and I think that's how <laughs> that sort of became a part of the character. Uh -huh. He would just, out of boredom, just go, mm. <laughs> and um, we would laugh like school children, and then and they eventually incorporated some of that into the movie. The one sort of famous moment that came up was, it was really uh, Rob Minkoff who came up with the line, um, I think, uh, what do you want me to do, dress and drag and do the hula? What do you want me to do, dress and drag and do the hula? We were so in love with this idea in the movie that we said we have to pull out all the stops and we're gonna perform this in the biggest way possible. So we got Don Hahn yep. involved to play- He was uh, gonna play on the water bottle. A sparkless water bottle. We got Kenny Holiday to play the ukulele. Yep. And Rob and Roger pitched it and got to that line and blurted out, what do you want me to do? Dress and drag and do the hula. And I leapt out of my chair and Kent leapt out of his chair with the ukulele and we played this huge Hawaiian uh, war chant song. Everybody's laughing hysterically. And that's when Jeffrey said, uh, guys, I don't think this is gonna work. I think I it's think gotta be staying, staying alive. alive. <laughs> Jeffrey, God bless him, had it in his mind that we really needed to use Stan Alive, that they needed to go out there and do a big John Travolta and, and you know, to completely do the disco version. And we didn't have time to change it in the reels that we were putting together at that moment, which were getting ready for a big public screening, you know, one of those test screenings to get audiences' responses. So we went, we're gonna have to leave this in for this screening, and thank God the audience right. Roared. It got to like the biggest laugh in the whole movie, it's and it was like, good. okay, <laughs> that, that issue's taken care of. Exactly. <laughs> wow! If you're hungry for a hunk of fat and juicy meat, eat my buddy Pumba here because he has a treat. Uh, just in front, can we lean forward just to create a little more depth? Yeah, exactly. Maybe uh -huh. here, sir. Yeah, so Beautiful. Be like Beautiful. Now let's do one that's wildly gesturing. Ready? And one, two, wildly three. gesturing. And go! go. What? <laughs> one of the first questions that came up was this idea of music. 
Little Mermaid had already come out, Beauty and the Beast was to come out the year after that, and Aladdin the year after that, and they were all musicals. This was a talking animal movie. By early into 1991 was when the conversations began with Tim Rice. I think whether you're writing for an Argentine dictator's wife or for a warthog with wind problems, it's the same approach lyrically. I just have to make sure that the words the character says are plausible, A, for the character and B, for the story. And for The Lion King, it was not as incredibly difficult as it can be because the story was very strong. You know, Tim's first idea was to talk to ABBA about doing this, which was a head turner to say the very least and uh, a pretty, uh, pretty um, out there idea for, for an animated movie. But you know, Tim had had such incredible uh, success and collaboration with them. We had phone conversations, we had many conversations about this. I sent them materials. And finally, Benny called me and said, I just don't think we can do this. We're writing an opera. This is not really right for us. We don't see it, we don't want to do it. We had no songwriter. When you think of the great um, African composers of our time, Elton John wouldn't be the first guy that sprang into mind. <laughs> but what he had was a, a great gift of melody and, um, and the ability to tell story in music. Elton would write the songs uh, with Tim and, uh, and basically send us a demo. And so we would get this t literally cassette tape of Elton John singing, you know, whatever song it was, and then they yeah. kind of left it to us. They had gone to every great orchestrator in the world to have a go at orchestrating Elton's songs, and so I had to sort of make a decision in my own mind. Was I going to go and be intimidated by working on Elton's songs, or was I going to go and make them my own? And after about 20 seconds, I decided I had to make them my own because otherwise there was going to be no legitimacy to them. Hans Zimmer is the single greatest artistic creative collaborator that I have come across in my career in the movie industry. And without him, there'd be no Lion King. I started with Circle of Life, and I had this, I had this perfect idea that my friend Lebo M, who's a fantastic African musician, composer, lyricist, etc., would come in, and he's got this great voice. It was very important to have a large flavor of real African effects and, and sounds and indeed lyrics, which um, Lebo brought. Lebo Amp's influence on this project is so yes. enormous. We all kind of knew that sound from having heard um, Lady Smith Black Bombazo and then Paul Simon, but somehow the public had not figured out that it could be incorporated like this Well, they always like think it's, first then. of all, they call it folk music, or they think of it as a, a cultural phenomenon, as opposed to the fact that there actually is a composer named Lebo M who actually took a tradition, just like pop is a tradition, mm -hmm. and made his own songs. You know, these were troubled times in Africa. So we actually, <laughs> a lot of the lyrics are about give me back my country. They're very political, some of them. <laughs> then we did actually come to the point where, you know, the legal department at Disney said, um, we now need a translation for these lyrics. And we sort of went, oops, you know, the little animal is jumping over the hedge. You know. <laughs> I had this idea for this chant, and could I not find Lebo? I mean, he had just gone completely able. The directors were going to come at, I think, three o'clock or whatever in the afternoon. And let's say 2.30, there's a knock on my door, and it's Lebo, and I'm going, God, where have you been? And I've literally been looking for him for months. And he goes, oh, man, you know, so he comes in, and I just put some headphones on him and go, okay, start singing. And so what you hear at the opening is literally take one, the only take, I think, of this. <laughs> Yeah. 
because it wasn't going to be the expected fairy tale. The audience sits down and I was going to go and let them know you're not in Kansas anymore. This is going to be different. And to have this incredibly impassionate, very foreign sounding voice. The eureka moment in the movie is in Hans Zimmer's studio or Circle of Life. And we all stand in the booth and we hear what Hans has done with the first 25 seconds of it. And we all go, that's it. Actually, Elton got really excited. We had a rough storyboard version of that put to place to Hans's uh, score of it. By the end of that sequence, he was jumping up and down in his chair and he was so happy with it. When everybody started hearing that, everybody was like, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty powerful stuff. And, and I think one of the best decisions they made on this movie was to use that entire song as the trailer. There's the whole thing, and everyone just went, I gotta go see that. We actually put it in theaters. This was pretty unusual. Put it in theaters at least six months, if not yeah, longer, as a trailer. before the movie, the whole song. And it ended with that big, you know, <laughs> with the Lion King logo. And uh, I think that certainly gave that us an idea excited. because every time people would see it, they got really excited about the yeah. movie. There was a promotional thing with um, Jeffrey Katzenberg. Ernie and I went out with <laughs> a tour with Katzenberg. And, and some live animals. And, li and he would bring out lions, and then they would talk about the movie, and then they would show some clips. And, and then Ernie and I would come out and do a little banter and sing <laughs> Hakuna Matata. But uh, what, the first time we Raise, did it... Raising funds <laughs> to, make it, to make it go. We could finish the We movie. needed a little support sure. to finish yeah. <clears throat> But the first time we did it, and uh, we, we were watching, and they showed the, 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 the two clips from the movie, I thought to myself, well, this, it, it does seem special. And that there's something, this is, it not only is it good, it's there's something very special about this. At like four in the morning, we got this phone call from Jeffrey and Dick Cook who said, the numbers are coming in and it's breaking records. I remember that phone call, I was just going, what? what? <laughs> and he's spouting numbers and my brain doesn't deal with numbers very well at all. I'm going, okay, that's great, that's great. Yeah, good night, Jeffrey, good night. <laughs> it wasn't until the, kind of the next day that it kind of sunk in. <laughs> Lion King became a giant money earner because of its box office because of its merchandise, and everyone wanted to get into the business. If Aladdin didn't convince you to get into the business, Lion King did, and the whole paradigm starts to shift, and everything changed after that. Here we are almost 20 years later, and I think if you look four or five of the top 10 or 11 movies of 2010, uh, are animated features. The Lion King showed that you could have what we define as a blockbuster with drawings. And that's stunning because I don't know since Snow White if anybody really thought of it that way. When people went to see Snow White, everybody went to see it. It was not a kid's movie. And now, sitting here in the new millennium, you see people like Steven Spielberg and Bob Zemeckis and Peter Jackson making animated movies. And, um, and they're spectacular. So it's a boom time for animation. And I can't point directly to Lion King, but certainly Lion King was a movie that made everybody sit up and take notice. By the summer of 1994, Lion King is a giant hit. Michael Eisner kept saying, why aren't we doing Lion King on stage? And I said, Michael, you can't plop Lion King down on the stage. It's so inherently filmic. We had always joked during working on it. <laughs> right. Well, they'll never make this into a Broadway musical because you imagine everybody hopping around in fuzzy costumes, right. looking like animals. My reaction on hearing it was going to Broadway was, they're mad. You know, how can you do this? I was a bit worried it might look like cats, but a bit bigger. I didn't think immediately this will be bigger than cats as a show, but I thought it would be like cats, but with bigger cats, if you see what I mean. <laughs> Tom and Peter, either they came up to see me or they called me and they said, we have an idea for Lion King. I said, what? They said, well, how about Julie Taymor? I said, I'm not quite sure who she is, remind me. You know, I had no idea who she was, but I tried to pretend I knew something. And I said, okay, pick a time and have Julie come make a presentation. Lion King movie comes out. Mm -hmm. It's a big stinking hit. So I rang you up mm -hmm. and you were right away reasonably friendly about it. You know, you said, send me the stuff. 
if you remember this, I yes. sent you Rhythm of the Pride Lands, the soundtrack to the movie, and I think a video in those days, because we didn't have a, we had a video, we didn't have DVD in those days. I would have been suspicious if you had said, we don't want your style or what you have to bring, but that was not the point. The well, point that was, was, in fact, was to, was to use what is, to, to have why you Why would you it? come to me? I was not famous, I didn't have a commercial hit, so clearly if you're coming to me, it's for something that you think I have to offer. You were saying, let's see if we can match these worlds together and what will we come up with? I think we all were skeptical, I think it's the right word, that this opera director who had never done anything commercial would have a means to tell a story in a magical way. As a director, you're always looking for the abstraction of what the whole is. And it's very simple in, in Lion King. It's the circle. It's the circle of life. It's the sun. It's Mufasa's head. It's the circle. Mufasa, who is the, the center of the show and the center of, in a sense, the balance of what the, the narrative is about, if you look at his mask, it's a circle. And if you look at Julie's original designs for the mask, um, you'll see a series of circles, and then this is how she interpreted that design into a physical mask, which she sculpted. Scar is the opposite of that. And this absolutely reflects, this, uh, this mask absolutely reflects the design that Andreas Deja did for the movie. The success of the movie is its humanity. It's not that they're animals, it's that they're humans in animal guise. So the mask was the solution. The double event mask, where you would never hide the performer. The um, singing lioness is where these, they're almost like a full crown. You can see that, and it sits on top of the head, right? So the actor's face is then right here. You remember it as well as I do, the day that we presented then the whole text of the show in a reading and then some, some puppets and masks to the studio. How'd that go? Do you remember? Yeah, of course. Do you really want to talk yeah. about it? This is our chance to tell our history. Uh, I know, but the, the, the point is that, that um, the non-theater people did not believe that it could work. They felt that you could have masks and puppets for the chorus, but that never could you have a principal in this kind of double mask because the question was, how does the audience know where to focus? And in the theater, the dimensionality of theater allows the audience to focus on the puppet and forget about the puppeteer. I believed in that completely, that, that we would be able to do this on the stage and you'd enjoy the art of seeing how the actor moves Timon, but then you'd believe in Timon as well. One of the ideas was to do this as a costume instead of doing it here as a puppet, right? The idea that he would be something that people would wear with maybe makeup or a mask. But in this case, he fits in front of the actor. The head's usually about here. The arms are down here and the feet are attached to the actor's feet. It's almost a, 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 a sort of modified version of Japanese bunraku. Julie calls it a humanette. The secret was the design because, I mean, I think every, this image that all shot through our heads probably was like a Disneyland parade. You know, whether that kind of design, you know, like taking our design and making them three-dimensional, but yeah. you know, Julie Timor did this incredible yeah, design thing on it stuff. where it took it into a different universe. We went down to Florida, and my recollection of this is that you brought um, very few pieces, but one of them was the gazelle wheel. Mm -hmm. In traditional puppet theater, you would put a screen up where the circles are, and you would see the little gazelles leaping. In traditional puppet theater, you would hide. You'd put a, mm -hmm. a box around it, masking, around it masking and you wouldn't see the people actually moving it. And the, the big concept on the theatricality of The Lion King is the enjoyment of the art of making it. Pitch meeting was really simple. Julie moves the gazelle wheel across the floor, the little gazelle wheel. And all of us go, that's it. It was so creative. Just our presentation, forget the show. It was one of those things that you did not have to go back. You did not have to ask your colleagues what they thought. You just said yes. It took me a long time to sort of figure out what Julie was doing. And that really what she was doing was she was doing magic. She managed to do what I 
had hoped to do with that opening chant, you know, something that is so iconic and so draws you in and so moves you. She does with the opening of the play, and I'm, I have never seen anything like it. Everybody has an, a deep emotional reaction to it. I mean, people start crying at the opening of a play. That's the wrong way around. Usually you have to work really hard to earn that somewhere in act three. And she did it in, you know, she does it in the first second. It's thrilling. It's like uh, makes the hair stand up to when they when it starts. I, th I thought that, yeah. that show was great. I remember you were at the opening. Yes, I went to, way way later, and I went backstage, and I said, <laughs> you know, I was adult Simba. But, uh, he says that all the time. <laughs> I play adult. He goes Simba. to clubs. I was adult Simba. They don't let yeah. him in. The puppeteer actor dancers were like all choreographed and they'd all work together. So it was like five people and a puppet who became a giraffe or a gazelle. It was this huge team effort of everybody becoming not invisible, but, but together into one thing. So you weren't looking at this big crowd of people working a puppet, you were looking at one character. When did you figure out that it was a sensation? In Minneapolis. In Minneapolis? Yeah, the first performance. There was something that was very critical to me that happened in Minneapolis, uh -huh. and it had to do with race. And when we went to Minneapolis and had that mixed crowd of, of, of African Americans and Caucasians and just all kinds of people, and it's the first time their children get to yeah. see a king who was African, because it really is about race for, for African Americans. And for white audiences, it had nothing to do with race. And that is a really interesting place to be. You were the first woman to win a Tony Award for directing a musical. And I remember weeping, openly weeping as you walked up. Well, I, I remember what I said, because um, on opening night of The Lion King, my father went into the hospital and never came out and never saw it. And I think for me, uh, the Tony Awards that night were, I said on the Tony Awards, I acknowledged my parents who had always encouraged me to play, play, play. And so it was really more a kind of sadness. And, and I just felt that as well, the lack of my father's presence there, but knowing how proud he would be and my mom was there. And so it was thrilling, but it was also that terribly bittersweet thing that happens when you lose someone who's so important to you. There's a little piece that still exists in that story that's part of my own time and something that was kind of tragic and hard. And there's a connection for me that's very deep and, um, you know, very uh, emotional. Lion King is truly a timeless story. It stirs up all those fairy tales that come from a long, 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 long time ago and that are sort of universal and all part of us. You know, I walk down this hallway and I'm reminded of the legacy of Beauty and the Beast, of Lion King, Aladdin, and it is the epitome of what this company stands for. The animation, it, we are so well known for animation and what it's all about.
there was this threshold that you had to reach, for me anyway, that can you make your stuff as good as the old guys? And I think all of us felt that, that there's a, there was a legacy and you didn't want to do stuff that would drag it down. You wanted, you wanted to try and measure up to the, the people who came before. Seeing Lion King out there and having a life of its own out beyond the movie is like winning the lottery. It's humbling, it's thrilling, it's a testament to not only the people that made the movie, but Julie Taymor and the people that put together the cast. And, and that's pretty great for a bunch of guys and girls in Levi's in a warehouse in Glendale to come up with something that has had that long of a success is uh, unbelievable. I remember that. You guys. Is it Ellen? Um, <laughs> first of all, thanks for coming in because I know a lot of you flew in for this and we haven't seen each other in a long time. So I um, just want to propose a toast. We made a great movie and to get together with you guys who are uh, good friends and amazing artists is a real treat for me and I'm sure for all of us. So cheers to Lion King. Cheers. The collective group of people came together at the right moment, with the right tools, the right everything, and were really committed and passionate and focused on making art and making it the best they could. <laughs> the people who have touched The Lion King and its texture, this tapestry of The Lion King, are deeply moving to me because no one knows they're there. Animation and theater are in many ways arts of the invisible that the greatest contributions people make are so often unrecognized, are in fact unseen. But the power of The Lion King is in that humanity. The irony is it's a story with no people in it, but its whole power are those people. And they get no credit for it. And I always say, all these people made this.